Hello, um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I'm up there in the right-hand corner, uh, and I'm speaking from Boston here. And my collaborator is uh, Martin Quinson from the University of Rennes, and also Inria in France. So today I'd like to talk about uh, in vivo model checking for multi-threaded programs. And uh, we have this system called S-Thread. We'll say a little more about it. So the talk will be in two parts. First, there is in vivo model checking. And here I want to just get across the main concepts. And normally I wouldn't uh, spend a lot of time on demos. In this case though, it happens that I just want to show the utility of our approach and maybe the simplest way is a demo. So that's why I have here a demo is worth a thousand pictures. Um, and of course a picture is worth a thousand words. So therefore a demo is worth a million words. So let's start. <clears throat> so first definition, what do I mean by in vivo? So in vivo model checking, the model checker should run directly on the original binary executable. So we, this is important if that original binary is going to, for example, access a large database or uh, access a server for some special service or do a lot of file IO, whatever. So the advantage of in vivo is that we can directly analyze the running process. We don't have to somehow model what happens when it accesses a remote database because it will remote access the remote database live. There's nothing to model. So the advantages of this approach are that there's no compiler generated intermediate representation. Uh, in particular, the code is running natively in the original environment. And as you expect with all model checkers, we'll still get, if there are race conditions, then these race conditions will produce a trace schedule that exhibits the safety violation. And a safety violation might be deadlock, or it might be perhaps an assertion violation. Uh, and then finally, the model checker can then run this newly found trace schedule directly within a familiar GDB session. Uh, and you're using the same binary, both for running standalone and for doing model checking. So therefore it is in vivo. So let's talk about that. So, so there are two primary goals here. Um, it can be used to verify correctness of a concurrent algorithm. In particular, I should emphasize in vivo. The in vivo part is what is novel here. Uh, so we can uh, verify correctness in an in vivo setting. Uh, whatever that might entail in terms of remote access, remote resources. And we can also use this pedagogically to provide immediate feedback to students learning to employ, for example, POSIX threat system calls or multi-threaded algorithms. By the way, I forget, forgot to mention, but me up in the corner, uh, that background is the Boston skyline since I'm speaking from Boston. Any case, moving on, so let's think about what is involved in a bug, especially a bug involving multi-threaded uh, computations. So we want to first identify that a bug exists. And when it's a rare race condition, we may, not, we may never see it. So it's important to use a model checker to look at all possible thread schedules. Once we can identify an execution, execution trace that leads to something bad like deadlock uh, or uh, possibly an assertion violation, we want to know how we got there. So we want to make that deterministic so we can replay it and then we can diagnose it. Once we have diagnosed what the problem is, we can then create a bug fix. Uh, and here again, hopefully deterministic replay in a debugging environment will help. So that's the goal. Just a very brief reminder of some of the basics that you probably all know anyway. Um, the, so here's a simple example of deadlock. In this case, we have an initial thread. That thread will create a second thread. 
the second thread runs thread to start. Here is thread to start. And it decides to, the second thread decides to lock mutex two. As long as it goes on and then locks mutex one, everything is good and it can release. But suppose it locks mutex two, and then the operating system decides at exactly that point to then switch back to thread one. So now thread one has locked mutex one, thread two has locked mutex two, and nobody can proceed because it's not possible for thread two to lock the remaining mutex one. It's not possible for thread one to re lock the remaining mutex two. So ultimately, uh, this gives rise to the concept of a model checker. In a model checker, we keep track of the entire global state, thread one and thread two both. Maybe we'll let thread one execute first and we end up in this state. Maybe thread two executes first and we end up in this state. If we're lucky, thread two keeps executing and eventually uh, will succeed. Notice there could be a possible transition here where thread one be blocked, but since if it is blocked, then that just means that thread two will run. The only case we want to avoid is when there is no possible transition when every transition would be blocked. That would be deadlock. And that can happen if the operating system happens to schedule threads where they keep interleaving constantly like this. Okay, good. So in the original paper, this was based on SimGrid. SimGrid uh, is, uh, has a long history since 2003. It's very sophisticated, state of the art, uh, and uh, it can handle both multi-threaded, uh, both clusters, HPC for MPI, and also distributed applications. And you can see this for the details, and there's a little more description of that in the paper. However, we're not going to talk about SimGrid in the talk. Uh, here, we're going to talk about uh, Mac Mini. So why are we switching to a different uh, model checker? Well, Mac Mini didn't exist when we wrote the paper. So McMini was developed by the first author uh, after uh, the paper had already been submitted and accepted, but by now it's more than a year later and inspired by the, uh, the what we saw with SimGrid, uh, the first author, me, I was looking for a way to bring that to the classroom, both in an undergraduate course and now lately even in a graduate course. So it's much simpler. It doesn't have the nice optimizations that you would hope for like partial order reduction, uh, but it's still sufficient to reproduce all of the examples from the paper. And hopefully it's sufficient to reproduce any bugs generated by students who are learning multi-threading. So it's a kinder user interface designed for ease of use for the students. And when we get to the demos, you'll see exactly what I mean by that. So McMinney's implementation is fairly simple. It de depends on LD preload. Uh, LD preload means that the McMinney library will be loaded before all other libraries. And so now if we make a call to anything in the pthread library, perhaps pthread mutex lock, we'll go to the McMinney library first, but it's okay. It will pass it on to the standard pthread library. Everything happens just as you expect. Similarly, if you call pthread create, it gets passed on to Linux itself, which will create a new thread. And so you really will have a new physical thread. There is no intermediate logical description uh, generated by some compiler. When you have a new thread, it is really there physically in the system, in the computer. So the, uh, but now McMini can actually interpose and so McMini can choose which thread primitive will be executed first, thread A or thread B first. And in fact, McMini will ensure that we test all possible thread schedules up until the given length so that if any of those thread schedules results in deadlock or assertion failure, we will see it. Good, so that's the first part of the talk. Now let's move on to the demos. So the concepts I think are clear. Uh, we're using standard model checking. Um, in this case, because it's McMini, it cannot cover as many steps before it simply runs out of time, but still it can certainly execute perhaps about 20 
thread primitives before eventually it runs out. And the uh, high powered ones like SimGrid could go even further. So again, we'll come back to this very simple example of deadlock. So thread two decides to lock mutex two, thread one decides to lock mutex one, and now we have deadlock because thread two will be blocked when it tries to lock mutex one and vice versa here. So let's look at that in a demo. <clears throat> so here we are. This is in McMini version 0.6J, if that matters. And we'll make it. It's quite small. It's actually less than a thousand lines of uh, code in C. And <clears throat> now we're ready. Let's go to the test subdirectory. And let's make there. And in particular, I want to look at mutex deadlock. That's what we just saw. We can run it by itself and nothing happens, basically because it's in deadlock. So it turns out that here, if the student tried it, they would have seen the deadlock immediately. So here it results in deadlock. Notice this is an absolutely standard program. The only thing we changed is we added a declaration for McMini itself. But other, and the program can run right now without McMini. We'll do it again. Now let's run with McMini and see what happens. So McMini, and we run, and it says, wow, we hit deadlock. And we, can, we know what this deadlock is. If thread zero gets blocked, thread zero runs, but only locks one of the mutexes. Thread one runs and only locks one of the mutexes. And then we have deadlock. Maybe we want to see a little more about what was happening there. So let's run it in verbose mode. And now you can see it running through all the possible schedules. There are only 13 schedules for this very sh this deadlock that arrives very quickly. But now that we know about this deadlock, especially for the students, but I think it's helpful for anybody, let's put in that trace that resulted in the deadlock. So now we would quickly hit on that deadlock, even in verbose mode, it would just go immediately to this one case. But now let's run it also within GDB. So run. Here we go. Here is our trace. We're currently executing in thread zero in this numbering. In GDB, we can look at the threads. And there's only a single thread so far. Let's continue. Um, if we continue, oops, I didn't want to do that. Now we have created the second thread. And if we wish, we can stop and look at thread number three according to GDB numbering. Look at where we are. And here it is. It's running in based on thread two start. We can look back at thread two where. And that's running, of course, in main, and we're good. And so continue, continue. At this point, we see that we're exiting, uh, and we're exiting presumably because we have reached deadlock. So uh, because here we have a thread, well, let's look into threads. We'll look, let's look at thread three, where. Thread three is trying to lock mutex one. How about thread two? Thread two is trying to lock mutex two. And this is the essence of the deadlock. Each is trying to now lock the other guy's mutex and they're stuck. Good. So we've done our first simple demo. It gives you the rough idea. And now let's go back to the slides because I want to show you next what happens when you take a more complicated problem. So in this case, we just saw exactly this happened. We discovered this deadlock case. In the paper, you'll see four examples of code. Uh, and in each case we show, in this case, using SimGrid, how we can come up with a trace that yields the deadlock. Uh, but moving on, we'll next highlight the ABA problem. The ABA problem is for this last one. <clears throat> 
So let's briefly describe what it is. This was a special interest because I'm in at least my case, the first author, we had this project DMTCP and we had interest, introduced a lock-free stack algorithm for providing memory. It was fast and efficient, no use of mutex, no use of semaphores. Uh, it just used essentially test and set or compare and swap. The only problem is <coughs> after about two years in an application where we're running with lots and lots of threads that are being created constantly, we found a bug. And it took us a week to figure out why, but here's the essence of the bug. So we have the ABA problem, thread A executes, then thread B, and then thread A comes back to finishing up. Thread A is trying to do pop. Thread B is doing pop, pop, and push. And then finally, thread A can finish up doing the pop was trying to do. So thread A is going to pop X from the stack. So it discovers where is a pointer to the first node on the stack. It discovers a pointer to the second node on the stack. It will pop the first node and then it'll set top of stack to point to the second node, Y. Except just before thread A can finally do the actual pop, we'll move in and thread B will take over. Thread B is going to pop X, it pops Y, and then it pushes X back onto the stack. So now the stack looks different and thread A doesn't realize this. Finally, thread A comes back and says it already knows the first element of the stack. It knows the second element. It pops the first element and makes the top of stack point to the second element, but that's wrong. Notice that the box is in gray. Every time a box is in gray, it's because we took it off the stack. And so now uh, when we test this with an assert, we're going to dis discover that Y is supposed to be off the stack and yet top of stack is pointing to it. And that gives us a bug. So let's go to the demo and analyze that. Now we'll go to MCABA and let's make each of these versions. There is a readme. Let's look at version four briefly. In version four, Go. In version four, we see exactly the problem that I described. Thread A does a pop, thread B does a pop, a pop and a push. And now we're going to allow them to interfere with each other at any point whatsoever. And the way we'll do that is we'll use a schedule yield uh, primitive provided by McMini. So because we're going to access a shared variable stack, we'll say let's yield the schedule in case any other thread wants to interfere. And then here's another schedule yield because again, we're going to access the stack. And what will happen is thread B is going to suddenly be scheduled in exactly here just before we do the compare swap. Thread B will do a lot of bad things for us and then we'll continue here and we'll see the bug. So let's do that. So made, yes. We'll test it. It passes our test suite fine. We can run a lot, no problem. There's no bug here, but in fact there is. So McMini MC ABA4. Well, we don't really want to print out all that print out. We'll send the standard out to dev null. And while we're at it, let's make it verbose so we can watch it the progress. So now we can see all the different traces that are being tested. And the result for each test is recorded. And McMini tries to figure out, is this leading to some deadlock? And there is an assertion failure, not a deadlock, but an assertion failure. And that assertion failure is because that node was both off the stack and on the stack. And so what we'll see is we test the stack length and the wrong thing happens. So uh, at this point we can run again. Initial trace. GDB, we don't need verbose anymore. And let's bring back our standard output so we can see what's printed. Run. And as before, 
here we go. Here is the uh, trace that leads to bad things. We can continue. And if we look, look for how many threads do we have? Well, there's still only one more th one thread. Why? Well, let's look at the stack. Here on the stack, we can look at main. So at this point, let's do a listing. Line 123 is where we're at. List 123. Um, in main. And why am I getting? Okay, MCAB4. Run, continue, continue. Still only one thread. Look at that thread too. Where? And let's look at main. So for main, we want to go to call frame number three. That's where I made my mistake. And call frame number three will do a listing. It's line 123. And now we can see that we were in the middle of pushing onto the stack Y. So we can continue, continue, and eventually we'll get to the bug. Now we would imagine we have more than one thread, and we do, and so on. Good. And so let's briefly now do the same for the case of MCABA5. And we can see that there's a certain amount of randomness set in. Each time we run, it's slightly different, but apparently no bug. And if we look at it, here we're using a choose function. The choose function says we can choose either to choose the value zero or one at the next step. If we choose zero, then we're gonna do a push. If we choose one, we're gonna do a pop. And so here now, we're actually going to look at all possible sequences of push and pop. We don't depend on already knowing how to find the bug. We look at all sequence of push and pop to find where the bug is. And let's do it. We already saw that we don't see the bug unless we use McMini. Let's use McMini. And I could continue to do this. In fact, that's gonna take about five minutes. Since that'll take five minutes, I'm gonna cheat and I'm going to go to the readme. And the readme shows you the bug that would result. Here is the initial trace. So let's run it. Good, we don't want verbose and run by itself. Of course, we exhibit the trace immediately. Maybe we want to look at a GDB, run. And as before, here we see the trace. Uh, thread zero, the original, the first thread created, the second thread created. And at this point, the schedule we're choosing and we're choosing the second value. Here we're choosing the first value, here we're choosing the first value. And that gives us the result. And that then leads to the, um, the assertion. So if we just run it to the end, disable one and continue, then we can see we're about to abort because the assertion failed. The assertion that failed is in frame four, the stack length. And essentially what happened is the stack length was going to compute an infinite length stack because one node was both on the stack and off the stack at the same time. Good. So at this point, we have now demoed both the simple demo and ABA. Are there any questions? Thank you. Bye.